Uh, my name is Don Blake. I'm a chemistry professor at UC Irvine, and I've been involved in VOC analysis um, since the 1980s. Um, VOCs, most of you or many of you know that the VOCs are very important in terms of, of air quality in urban areas, but uh, or today I will talk a little bit more about uh, some of the things that can be done to um, try and improve uh, uh, air quality and, and, and the quality of VOC measurements. Okay, so I, I come from uh, Southern California and uh, we were uh, infamous for our, our smog problems back when I was a kid. And so what we see here is um, on, the, on the left panel, uh, going back to not quite 1960, but um, um, the, the, the red uh, that we see over here, I mean, I was in high school at this time. And, and once again, to, to have ozone at, at 700 ppb is, is just a joke. And that's a one hour average. And then you can look at the, the um, uh, eight hour average it's still up to 400. Um, and so huge amount of ozone. And uh, we, we approached the problem, trying to reduce NOx and, and VOCs. And, and at some point we learned uh, that we needed to consider uh, whether something was NOx or VOC limited. What we do see is, is that in about 20 years ago, we started um, PM 2.5 measurements. And, and that has uh, dropped uh, drastically in the last uh, 20 years. What we see here is, is what, what we have done in, in the LA basin is in terms of reducing NOx um, and, um, and VOC. It shows us going down, this is percent, it shows us going down to about 2% of what it had been. Um, the the uh, NOx has dropped this much and ozone has dropped this much. So clearly we're doing something right. Um, so this is a, a slide that has a lot of information on it, but it shows the, the importance of, of VOCs and the variety of sources of VOCs. It's not just um, trees. It's not just the exhaust pipe of your car. It's not coal-fired power plants. It's everything. It's cosmetics. It's paint. It's solvents. It's a lot of things. And so to try and, and uh, understand what a particular urban area's um, main um, VOCs are, you have to make a lot of measurements. You have to like, make a lot of, of, of important and, and accurate measurements. The important thing here is to see that we go from VOCs um, right here, uh, it makes NOx. Um, it also, some of the VOCs can be oxidized to four, to, as, as sort of a, um, secondary organic aerosols. And those are, 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 are very, very important. Um, today I'll be talking mainly about gases that are uh, ozone pre precursors. Um, so if we look at Hong Kong, and I'm not trying to pick on, on Hong Kong, I've already showed you how bad the air quality in, uh, in California was. And so your problem is much uh, less than, than what we had. What we see is, is about the last 20 years, um, the, the um, PM 2.5, pardon me, um, has decreased somewhat, you know, it, it, it increased and it's been on a nice decrease for about the last 15 years. That's great news, okay. Um, the not so great news is that if we look at ozone over that same period, we're seeing a, 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 an increase at three different places. And this level right here of, of uh, you know, 160 or so, uh, we now are, have surpassed that in the year 2019 uh, at all three stations. And so while we have a trend of decreasing PM 2.5, which is good news, uh, the ozone has not followed uh, that same trend. And so the question is why? And what can, not just Hong Kong, but what can the Greater Bay Area do to try and change this trend so that it is also decreasing? So um, my research group measures uh, VOCs. And, um, and so this is from a, a study that we did, uh, an airborne study um, in Korea several years ago. And, and what I, what I the, the take home message here is that these are the average mixing ratios of 25 gases that we measured in the air, um, in and above uh, Seoul. Uh, the middle uh, panel is the OH reactivity, and that is how fast OH reacts with the gas on the left um, to, to then be a precursor to ozone formation. Uh, and, and then the panel on the right is OH reactivity. And so what we see is, is that the highest concentration of, uh, in, of all gases in um, uh, Seoul was ethane. And yet we look over here, ethane really doesn't have very much in terms of OH reactivity. The three gases that do, so look at this, look at how small isoprene is. Isoprene is, is, is on the order of a 100 ppt. 
Yet because it has such a large, uh, a very fast reaction with ozone or with, with uh, hydroxyl, it's actually the most important gas, and sold, the most important gas in terms of ozone precursors. Second is toluene. Toluene, once again, was third in, in concentration. And then um, third was xylene, which is, is right here. So once again, don't, don't get confused that the, uh, that the highest concentration gases are the ones that are the most important. Uh, you have to consider um, the, the reactivity. And uh, these are four different cities. Um, this is in, in Pakistan, uh, Mecca, Hong Kong, and Seoul. And if we look at, at uh, Lahore right here, ethyne was the highest concentration gas there. If we look at Mecca, it was isopentane, Hong Kong. And then we look at, at uh, um, VOCs in, in Seoul and, and it's ethane. So it's, it's a different gas in each city. Now those are different countries, but I would be very surprised if we um, looked at five or 10 major uh, urban areas in the Greater Bay Area, um, that I think all of those cities would have a different profile like this. And so what that means is, is that we have to have accurate data. And in order for the, um, the people who are trying to regulate um, and reduce ozone, they need to know what the concentrations are. And as I said, in, in every city, it, it very well could be very different. It certainly is, is here. Um, and, and these just are, are uh, once again, showing that, that, uh, in, that, that the VOCs that are giving off ethyne and ethene are ma mainly exhaust in Lahore. Um, in Mecca, it was just gasoline evaporation. In Hong Kong, it's diesel buses and liquefied petroleum gas. And in Seoul, it was diesel compressed natural gas. Um, and so uh, um, different sources uh, give, uh, have different fingerprints. Now, the technique that I'm proposing this, this reactivity is not perfect. Okay, there are modelers. There are modelers that are, are sitting in on this uh, uh, talk saying, well, that's not the best way to do it. And that's true. Um, what we've done is we have compared, uh, this is for, for Seoul, uh, we have compared our just reactivity calculations based on some very, very detailed modeling. And, and what we see is that in, in this work, uh, the green, so 44%, in, in our simple calculation um, uh, of the ozone formed or the KOH uh, is aromatics. And in the, the model, it's 48. Isoprene, 17% and 24%. So it's not perfect, but once again, if you don't have a, access to a huge uh, uh, photochemical model, this type of, of uh, technique can, can help. We were involved years ago in a, uh, a study where um, air cylinders uh, or, or canisters were sent around the world to 30 or 40 different research groups. And uh, it was called NAMHEIS, and this is the fourth of, of four tasks. Um, and, uh, and as they say in their paper, you know, to assess the accuracy and comparability of non-methane hydrocarbons. So here are uh, some results from that paper. And my group was group 30. And so uh, what we see here is that, the, and this is sort of the, the, the deviation. Uh, this is one that means that, I mean, if you're exactly one, that you agreed perfectly with what the NCAR and EPA came up with in terms of, of what the concentrations were. And what you see is, is that, that my group, I don't know, measured, you know, we were pretty close to one uh, and the, the deviation range might've been about uh, 10 or 15%, I'm not sure. And then you had this group, which was a little bit low. Look at this group, this was after the fourth task. So, um, uh, once again, if, if you were this group and you were reporting, you go over here, that means you were about oh, seven times, your concentration you were reporting was seven times bigger than what it would be. And so how, how is a uh, you know, air quality official, um, how do you deal with that? Um, that would completely um, um, negate knowing whether or not something was VOC or, or NOx limited. Anyway, so, so you can look along here and there are five or 10 different groups that, that were, you know, statistically, the, the, the data looked nice and tight and they were close to one. This is what they came in, in terms of the, the paper. Um, they determined that, that the, the UCI group, uh, we were, our average was one, um, meaning that, that we had the same number that, that, they, that they received or that they got. Um, this is one way to look at it. Another way they looked at it and we were still number one. And so the, 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 the thing is, is that these round robins can help groups identify problems and and they are extremely 
useful. And we have done some where we've actually been the ones that sent standards to different EPA groups. Okay, so, uh, you know, I, I worry that people don't necessarily understand why we run standards. And so this is just an example. These are our data, data from my research group. And this was over a 40 day period. We ran 24 hours a day and we run a standard every eight canisters. So during that day, um, we, we ran about uh, six, maybe five or six standards each day. And we plotted them versus time. And what you can see is this is just in peak area. So this is on an FID. And what we see is, is that the, uh, the, the, the detector was not constant. Okay, this is the same, it's like one cylinder of air that is run five times a day for, for 40 days. And so we have 200 uh, data points. And what you see is, is that it kind of goes up and then it kind of drops like this. And so it's not a huge drop, okay? The difference is the biggest area was 28,000 air units and the smallest was about the 25,500. So that's, you know, six or 8% difference, but it's still six or 8%. So we can run a standard and by knowing what that standard is and by running it often, first of all, we can tell if we have a problem because it, we, we know that we should be getting very similar values every two hours when we run the standard, um, for every three hours. And so, um, um, so standards are important to help you identify that you've got a problem. But second of all, this allows us, we actually have a, an equation here. And this equation is a curve fit to this. And so if we started running, if we wanted to know what a canister's value concentration was at the beginning, we would apply the time, which is this time right here, um, on the X, we plug that number in and we could actually calculate. So that as long as you travel along this line, we're going to yield the same, the same value. So if the concentration was, you know, 2.33 parts per billion, according to this, even though it's a bent, um, curve, we would get 2.3 PPB for the entire 40 days. And so running standards allows you to go back and, 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 uh, um, uh, determine whether in fact you had any drift. Um, also if you have a problem. Second of all, so my group uses whole air standards and whole air standards are just compressed air with some stuff doped into it, but it was real, real air. And so this is an example. Um, we ran um, the whole air standard twice. Um, and that's, if we look at this, this is the, uh, this is the plot column. Most of us who are doing VOC work um, need to use a plot column for the C2, C3, maybe C4 um, hydrocarbons. And so very, very few groups, if any, are, are doing those light hydrocarbons with anything but a plot column. And so plot columns are sort of temperamental. And this is just an example. So here's propene. Yeah, this is the retention time of propene. I can't read this. But uh, what you see is, is that these two chromatograms, they fall right on top of each other. Retention time for propene in at least one of them was a 5.536. Um, if we look at ethine, okay, the ethine has moved a tiny, tiny bit, um, but it's at 6.139 minutes. If we look now at the three runs, three consecutive runs of a synthetic air standard, which is like, you know, hydrocarbons in a nitrogen mix or even nitrogen and oxygen mix, but not whole air, um, then look at, look at how the retention times change. So these are the, these are three, this is for propene. So we have propene here. We've got how the butane changed, how this changed. Look at the ethyne, huge changes in ethyne. And so the problem with this is not just the accuracy of the standard, but you want your standard to be exactly the same makeup as the gases you're measuring. Okay, so the ambient. And so if you're a, a technician, um, you wanna know that, that the retention time of propane is 5.536 and not one of these guys. And so it, it, uh, y there's a lot of action going on in this area in terms of VOCs and even some halocarbons that come out there. And so if you pick the wrong peak, then, then you're in trouble. So once again, whole air standards allow you um, to, to be spot on with your retention times. Um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, doing independent audits. And I think that they are, are, are critical, I'd say once a year. Um, and, and what we do is we take uh, several different vessels that have concentrations of gas, whole air at different concentrations. We plumb them back into the, where the real time system goes. We let them run for three or four hours and then uh, data are, are kicked out. And so these are uh, examples of data that we did uh, at, at uh, several years ago at Tong Chung and, and Juan. Um, we see this is in this case, the Tong Chung data, um, it's a little bit high for uh, ethane 
in, in all these cases. And it almost, I think, is because uh, there was actually something, there was a, a, an extra peak in the ethane, uh, because if, you, if we look at this, anyway, the, the point is, is that, that th this was informative to the, the folks running that station. Look at Dongguan, um, once again, this is the, the, the gray and the blues are UCI values. And so you can see that Dongguan uh, did, did pretty well for ethane. However, if you look at ethene, okay, now uh, Tung Chung looks good. And, and uh, Dong Guan um, looks like it's uh, oh, three or four parts per, per billion too high. And, and the same thing over here. So it's almost like there was a peak there. The point is, is that ethene is a lot more important in terms of, of uh, photochemical production of ozone than ethane um, because its reactivity with hydroxyl is much faster. So in this case, even though the ethane looked better at Dong Guan, the, the, this is a big concern here uh, in terms of ethane. So this, this once again, allowed the, the Dongguan station and the Tungcheng station to make some uh, changes and improvements. And here's a, once again, not scary, but a little bit bothersome is, is that isoprene, which I showed you in, in, in Korea, was the number one gas um, in terms of ozone production, was, was measured very nicely at Tungcheng, but uh, it wasn't even measured um, at, at Dongguan. So, uh, um, anyway, so this is once again where qualitatively it's important to do this study and also quantitatively it's important. Okay, um, I'm going to also suggest that, that at stations there's some somewhat regular um, auto sampler. Uh, these are my canisters from, from my group and we have an auto sampler. Um, and um, I'm, I'm going to show you some data once again from sort of that same time period. Um, this is from Macau and Heshan and, and Tung Chung and, and Dong Guan. And what we see is this is chloroform, not a terribly important gas, but what we see is, is that at Dongguan, for the first, this is uh, like every hour, um, that early in the morning, uh, there was a lot of this gas, um, and, and, and then it kind of flattened out, but it flattened out at about 50, whereas at the other sites, um, it was really pretty low uh, each time. So that tells you what chloroform does, but let, let's look at something else, methylene chloride. Okay, now methylene chloride, when you have, we're talking about 10 parts per billion of methylene chloride, that's a little bit scary. Um, and so here you've got methylene chloride, uh, high, high, and then you can see here at, at, uh, at uh, the, the green, which is uh, Tung Chung, is, is really quite low. I think I, okay. Um, next, this is ju I've just got a few examples like this. Same thing, lots of, of stuff at Dong Guan. Um, and this is on a regular scale. This shows what it looks like on a long scale. Long scale is sometimes nicer because it sort of spreads things out. And what you see is, is that, uh, that in, in uh, Tung Chung, uh, very, very low concentrations of, of this gas, whereas in, within China, they were higher. Uh, perchloroethylene looks like this. And this is a, a gas that, that, that worries not just me, but, but uh, some folks in Hong Kong, and that is 1,2-dichloroethane. And, and it has some health problems associated with it. And what we see, I don't know if I've got, yeah, I've got it on log scale, is that um, the concentration in, in uh, Macau and Tongcheng, you know, was, was I mean, actually, got down quite low in, in uh, Tung Chung, but values of over a, a, a thousand, uh, well, this is in parts per trillion, by the way. So over a PPB of this gas is, is a health concern. So um, anyway, but that, that's what, and, and, and this is butyl nitrate, just sort of shows, uh, this is a photochemical product, but it shows how canisters can measure gases that are not routinely measured at real time stations. And that's what's nice about having this augmentation of, of uh, an auto sample reflecting um, whole air samples at certain locations, gives you an idea is, okay, this is, this is what we have to worry about. So in other words, if you're in Tung Chung, I mean, in Dong Guan, you know that, uh, that you, you've got to worry about 1,2-dichloroethane. Uh, um, and once again, this was just at the station. The, 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 the station at uh, uh, Dong Guan was at a big uh, track and field stadium, a soccer stadium. So we weren't necessarily that close to the source. So um, anyway, I'll stop at that. Okay. So in conclusion, so VOCs um, play a, a, a major role in regional and urban um, air pollution. And in, in, in my world, that means ozone and, and then it's sort of uh, forming um, aerosols. Um, um, accurate quantification of VOCs is critical. I mean, if you don't have that, and you can once again use that example of the the round robin that we were involved in, that one group that measured, and their average concentration was seven times higher than the concentration that the, the EPA and NCAR said it was. Um, 
uh, you'd, you'd not be making the right choice on what kind of gases to regulate. Um, Holer standards are nice because it helps the field technician. Okay, they're, 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 not, they can, they're, very, they're accurate, but the fact is that they're whole air. Whole air means that it's got the 400 parts per million of CO2, and it's got a couple hundred parts per billion of, of uh, um, CO, and it's got two parts per million of, of methane. It's got what air is, what you're breathing right now is what's in that tank. Um, and so it makes it a lot easier for the field technician to match peaks up rather than saying, well, I know that all the ambient ones are here, and then I have to, the, the, uh, the standard is shifted in retention time. That makes it tough. Once again, I recommend round robin um, type intercomparisons on an annual basis or so. And this can be done for certification, quality assurance type um, um, studies throughout the Greater Bay Area. Um, the canister sampling reduces stress on the site folks because uh, basically once the, G the, the canisters are connected, there's no measurements that are made. So there's nothing that the field technician has to, to worry about. But those canisters can provide information um, about gases that are not being routinely measured. Some stations measure 30 or so VOCs, and uh, those may be the 30 important ones, but there may be some others that are not so important. And also, um, whole air allows you to measure gases. All the greenhouse gases that are important are in a whole air standard. And so uh, if you happen to have a mass spec or something that, that um, is, is accurate, or it's precise and sensitive, um, you can actually quantify the, uh, the, some of the greenhouse gases. And so, uh, so canister sampling, once again, is, is a nice addition to uh, real-time um, instruments. And so with that, I would like to thank you uh, for your attention. Uh, this is a slide that was uh, taken, or a photo taken in my research group um, last year, 2019, uh, in December, uh, when we had some visitors uh, um, to our lab. The folks, the three on the left are, are in my group. And then uh, later that day, just happened that Professor Wong Tao was, was in uh, um, at UCI and gave a lecture. And so this is a photo of he and uh, Barbara Flayson Pitts and, and myself. And uh, some of you may know Barbara Flayson Pitts because of her uh, books, Pitts and Pitts. Um, okay. And with that, I thank you very much.